All right. Uh, today we are going to start with chapter four, and now the control system design part is going to start. Okay. So until now we were doing all the preliminary background work in order to get to this particular point, and uh, from now on it's all going to be control system design, meeting specifications, and uh, doing block diagrams for fun. Okay. So the first block diagram that we will study today is a very simple control system uh, which you have already seen in your assignment. So so this is my reference signal, this is my output signal, this is my error, actuation error, oh there has to be one more error here. which is noise. So this is observation noise or measurement noise. Uh, this is my actuation noise or disturbance. Okay, we have a we have a perfect measurement device. Well, not a perfect measurement device, but we have a measurement device that in, that uh, figures out what the output output plus the measurement noise is, and that feeds back into the reference signal, and then goes into the controller. So this is my controller, and this is my plant. <coughs> So you've already seen uh, disturbance and actuation noise before. Uh, you've seen the reference signal and everything, but you haven't seen measurement noise so far. So I want to pause here a bit and ask you a simple question. You have a sensor which measures something physical. Okay, You have a temperature sensor that te measures the temperature. You have a pitot tube which measures the airspeed. You have potentiometer that measures the potential difference between two points, and so on and so forth. Okay. The question that I wanted to ask you is: Do you think that the measurement that you see on the device on the screen is the absolute perfect information, or there is some error in that particular information? What do you guys think? What's your experience? There is error. What kind of error would you think? Uh, is embedded in those sensors. Yes, absolutely. It depends on the sensors, and so quantization could be one way by which an error can creep into your reading, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I was, I was asking. What are the other ways by which error could creep into your measurements? Okay, so there was some idea there. Yeah. Perfectly flawless. Perfectly. Flawless? Not a single to the 10 billion decimal point. Okay. All right. So that's not the case, though. <laughs> that's wishful thinking, but that's not the case. Uh, any other thoughts? Why would error creep in uh, to your measurement device? Um, maybe some like, uh, like background, like background, interference. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 Interference. Yeah. Absolutely. Interference could be one reason. Yeah. Sorry? Manufacturing. manufacturing defects. That's actually a very important point. Manufacturing defects. You could have some bias embedded into your sensor because of manufacturing defects. And um, because of that, some amount of noise will automatically get embedded whenever you use that instrument to measure some physical quantity. Okay? Anything else? Yeah? Inputs coming from like, the outside environment. Inputs coming from outside <coughs> environment. Yes, there is a humming noise. So if I have a mic, it's picking up the humming noise from the background and that's changing the measurement that the mic is making about the voice signal in the room. 
uh, right? So as we have discussed, uh, so in the case of airplanes, there is disturbance because of the airflow in the environment, okay? So air is moving from one point to another. That adds to the actuation noise, that adds to the disturbance of the control signal that is being sent by the pilot, and that's what enters the plant. And then there is measurement noise or observation noise where if you have a pit or tube or if you have some other sensor that you're using to sense the physical quantity, it some amount of noise gets added, which is then eventually fed back into the controller, okay? So the controller's goal or the design, the, the, the design goal for the controller is to reject this noise, reject this noise, and improve tracking of the reference signal, okay? So that's the goal of the controller. Okay, so that's the goal of the controller. The signal here is known as the error signal E of S. And now I want to find the transfer function between E of S and all the inputs. So there are three inputs here, R of S, TD of S, and then N of S. Okay, so E of S equals to R of S minus Y of S. So this is the actual output. Uh, you know what, I shouldn't write this as E of S because it has embedded N of S automatically. So let me write it as E of S minus N of S. So this is the error, this is the input or reference, and this is the output. And we want error to be as small as possible. Okay, so in order to compute the error signal, we need to first figure out the transfer function between the, so we want to figure out what Y of S would be given N of S, TD of S, and R of S. So let's try and find out the transfer function. Uh, and for simplicity, let's try out, try to figure out the transfer function Y of S over N of S, because this is something we haven't done so far. We have done Y of S over TD of S. We have done Y of S over R of S. Let's try and do Y of S over N of S. So what's the first step for computing this transfer function? Okay. I want to know, so this is the problem. I want to compute the transfer function between the output and the observation noise. And the reason why I'm picking this is because this is something we haven't done so far. So I want to know what's the step one to compute this transfer function. Yes? Set, zero. set? set the other, other inputs to zero. So I'm going to set R of S equal to zero. So step one, set R of S equal to zero and TD <laughs> of s equal to zero. So I'm setting all inputs to zero, and only n of s is active. Now step two, I'm going to redraw the block diagram in terms of ns and ys, assuming that r of s and td of s are not present at all. So let's draw the block diagram. I have gc of s, I have g of s, I have Y of S, okay. 
okay so this is what the block diagram looks like okay so let me give uh, an intermediate signal uh, i want to call this something let's say x1 of s <coughs> so what is y of s in terms of x1 of s G C G X one. Uh, let me remove S completely. So Y equals to G C multiplied by G multiplied by X one. Now what is X one? X one is what is X one? Y minus. No, not y minus n. So these two are get these two signals are getting added here. Yeah, minus y plus n. That's right. Let me eliminate x one. So I have y equals to g c g y plus n. A negative sign goes in front. Uh, now I need to take all the y terms together. So I have y 1 plus gcg equals to minus gcg n this implies y over n equals to minus gcg over 1 plus gcg okay so i got the transfer function this would be my step 3 Okay, any question? Okay, yeah. Um, you said that the error signal um, was equal to ES minus in S. Is that correct? The error signal, so ES, uh, RS minus YS. But in this case, you have NS also getting added. Okay. So this is ES minus NS, the signal entering here. Okay. So okay. that's just a signal entering the controller. Entering the controller, yeah. Is that. So yeah. the actual error signal itself is just ES. That's right. Okay. So this is the error that we want to make sure is as small as possible. Okay. Any other question? OK. So I have this. Uh, Diagram of a real control system, a simple but real control system, which has three separate sources of input. One is the reference signal that we want to track. One is the noise, and then the other one, well, this is the disturbance or actuation noise, and this is the observation noise or measurement noise. Uh, in order to find out the uh, error signal, I need to figure out what the output signal looks like, because then the error is reference minus the output. So in order to find out the output, I need to know the transfer function between y and n, y and td, and y and r of s. Now y and r, the transfer function between y and r has been done several times in this class now. The transfer function between y and td was done in uh, one of the previous classes. Now we figured out what the transfer function between y and n looks like using the block diagram. And so if you, if you forgot, what the transfer function between y and r looks like, you can do the derivation in a very similar fashion. So let me just write down what the output signal looks like as a function of three inputs. So we have 
y of s is equal to gcg over 1 plus gcg multiplied by r minus o oh, plus g over 1 plus gcg td minus gcg over 1 plus gcg multiplied by n. Okay, now this is what y of s is. I want to subtract y of s from r of s in order to get the error signal. So my e of s is given by 1 over 1 plus gcgr minus g over 1 plus gcg g plus gcg over 1 plus gcg n. Yes. Is this equivalent to the equation above where we have R S minus R S? Yeah, so this so I'm just evaluating R S minus this big expression. Okay? So the R appears only in the first case. So you have R minus G C G over one plus G C G R. So that gives me this expression. And then there is no r here, so it, the, on, the only thing that happens is that the sign gets reversed. So you have minus g over 1 plus gcg, and the same thing happens with n as well. So here, the sign gets reversed at this point. And that's because these two terms don't depend on rs whatsoever. Okay, only the first term depends on rs. <coughs> Okay, yeah. yeah. How did you get the Ys equation? How did I get the Ys equation? So I know the transfer function between Ys and R to be GCG over 1 plus GCG. This is something we did in one of the previous classes. Then I know the transfer function between Ys and TD to be G over 1 plus GCG. This was done in the assignment. And then I derived the transfer function between Y and N to be minus GCG over 1 plus GCG, which is right there on the board. Now, it's a linear system. I can add the effects of individual inputs to get the output. Okay? Yes? On that first term with the R, um, if we're taking, no, down with the term, yeah. If we're taking that minus Y, it seems like we should have one minus GCG. Yes, so you have R, one minus. GCG over 1 plus GCG, right? So that gives you this expression. Okay. <coughs> okay. So if you notice this equation, we want to design a controller GC 
such that the error is small. Okay, so when is the error going to be small? Uh, we want this term to be small because we want to reject noise. We want this term to also be small because we want to reject measurement noise. And we want this term to be small because we want to uh, have as, we want the error to be small, right? So each of these individual terms needs to be as small as possible. And one thing that you will immediately notice is that this one and this one cannot be made small simultaneously. Okay? So this, let me call this uh, capital S of small s. And let me call this C of S, capital C of S. Okay? And we have the identity that S plus C is equal to 1 all the time. Okay? So if we want error to be small, we want each of these terms individually to be small. But the first thing that pops out of looking at this equation is that actually this term and this term adds up to 1, therefore they cannot simultaneously be small. Okay? And that's the problem that control designers face all the time. That if you want the error to be small, you have to make the right trade-off between the measurement noise, the gain of the measurement noise, and the gain with respect to the reference input. Okay? Um, you cannot minimize both of them simultaneously, and so if your problem has certain structure, then it will allow you to design a better controller. So what kind of structure do I mean? Well, if n has certain frequencies, you can design a controller which is very, which, whose magnitude is very small for those frequencies, and at the same time, it reduces the error between the reference signal and the output. Okay? So it can reduce this term for the specific frequencies of the reference signal, and at the same time, it can reject noise by making sure that GC is very, very small at that particular noise level. So for instance, low-pass filters, high-pass filters, or Butterworth filters, those kind of filters can allow you to reject measurement noise and at the same time improve the control performance. But that requires your noise to have certain structure, it should have certain frequencies. It can't be just, you can't have a blanket statement saying that no matter what noise you give to this particular system, it's going to reject that noise because as you can see the trade-off, there is a trade-off between the value of CS you can pick and the value of SS you will get. Uh, for the corresponding choice of CS, okay? And of course, whatever choice of CS you can pick is only through this transfer function, this controller transfer function GC, okay? Is this clear? Is this trade-off clear? You can't simultaneously minimize this term as well as this term in order to minimize the error, okay? And so we will see over a period of this class, not this particular class, but this semester, how to design the controller so that the specific frequencies of noises are suppressed in the output. Okay, any question about that? All right. Now one question that always is raised, if I give a step input to this particular error, uh, sorry, this particular system, I give it a step input, uh, how much is the steady state error going to be? So what is the concept of, what is steady state error? So let's say a design question. Is design GC such that steady state, steady state error is uh, small, okay? 
So what is steady state error? Well, it's limit t goes to infinity e of t. This is known as the steady state error. Okay, and I want to motivate it with a physical example. So when we turn on a ceiling fan, there is a transient phase where the fan is accelerating, it's uh, rotating faster at every moment than before. But eventually it reaches a steady state situation where it's rotating at a constant speed throughout. Okay, so that's the steady state. So there is a transient phase where Things are evolving, things are changing pretty rapidly. But then there comes a steady state where things do not change whatsoever. It's in an equilibrium state. Okay, so that's known as steady state. So mathematically, how do you express steady state? Well, it's the signal at t going to infinity. Okay, now of course this may not exist at all times. So you could have error signals that are periodic, in which case it will never have a limit. But in many cases and many systems that we will study for certain inputs, you will have a steady state and we want the steady state error or rather or, or equivalently limit t goes to infinity e of t to be as small as possible. So in order to analyze this, so remember this is a time domain concept. This is saying that as t goes to infinity, I want the error to be small. But what we have here is a transfer function approach or a Laplace domain uh, method. So there has to be a way to bridge the two gap. If we want to find out steady state error, is it possible to understand the steady state error by looking at the, uh, looking at the Laplace transform? And the answer is yes. And it comes from what is known as final value theorem. So how many of you have heard of final value theorem before? No one? OK, good. So let's study it. Which place? Okay. So let F T or zero to infinity to R be a bounded signal, okay? And Fs be the Laplace transform. So we need a bounded signal, we need a Laplace transform of that bounded signal. And the final value theorem is if limit t goes to infinity, f of t exists, then limit t goes to infinity, f of t is given by limit s goes to 0, s capital Fs. Okay, so this is final value theorem. It says that if a signal 
has a limit as t goes to infinity, then the final value of the signal or the limiting value of the signal is actually s multiplied by the Laplace transform uh, with limit s goes to 0. Okay? There is an equality here. Okay? So by looking at the Laplace transform of the signal, I can actually extract information about the limiting value of the function itself. However, the problem is you need to know that the limiting value exists. Okay? So if it does not exist, then this theorem means nothing because the hypothesis doesn't hold true. So let's look at an example. So example, the Laplace transform of sine of omega t is given by s over s square plus omega square. The question I want to ask is whether sine of omega t has a limit as t goes to infinity. What do you think? No? Okay. So sine of omega t is a periodic signal. If we look at the signal as a function of time, it looks, it just oscillates. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have a limit. It doesn't go to 0, it doesn't go to 1, it doesn't go to 500 or 1000 or 1 million. It just oscillates around minus 1 and 1. Wouldn't it be W instead of S on top? Is it W? Yeah. Let me check. How many of you think it's W? Let's, let's do a poll and that will be the answer. I did it for homework today. Okay. Let me check. Okay, I think it's W. Uh, he's right. Emmanuel is right. Oh, yeah. Emmanuel is right. Wow, okay. Good. <laughs> okay, it's, it's omega over s squared plus omega squared. Um, but it, it doesn't have a limit, okay? Now, let's look at... Let, let's apply the final value theorem. So I know that the hypothesis doesn't hold true, but let's apply the final value theorem nonetheless. So I get limit s goes to 0, s omega over s square plus omega square. This is equal to 0. Okay. So if we apply final value theorem, it says that the limit is equal to zero, but it actually means nothing because the hypothesis doesn't hold true. Okay, so just because the final value theorem is something doesn't necessarily mean that the limit will be equal to that number. It just means that, so you have to first know that there is a limit to the function that you are considering. So most of the times we will be looking at functions that are not sinusoidal in nature Whenever we talk about steady state error, things will not be sinusoidal, but it will be exponential. So e raised to minus t, which, so e raised to minus t actually looks like this, and so it has a limit. And therefore, the final value theorem can be applied for signals that are combinations of e raised to minus t. Or even if you have a sinusoidal, but that has a decaying amplitude, then even that signal converges to zero, and so you can apply a uh, final value theorem to signals of that type. Okay? So let's uh, look at another example. So Laplace transform of e raised to minus 80, which is given by 1 over s plus a. So, Emmanuel, is this correct or? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so e raised to negative 80, it looks like this. So, a is positive. a is positive. 
So in that case, it looks like uh, a function that looks like this. This is my t. This is my ft. Okay, let's apply final value theorem. What's the limit? T goes to infinity e raised to negative a t. It's equal to limit s goes to zero. S over s plus a, that's equal to zero. And that is indeed the case. Yes? So what does this result tell us? Does this mean that the error can go to zero? No, uh, uh, that's right. So we will use it for, so we will use final value theorem to ascertain whether or not the error is going to zero for a particular choice of controller and a particular choice of system and a particular choice of noise, uh, noise variables. So you could have no measurement noise, but you could have actuation noise. You could have no actuation noise, but a measurement noise. So you have to design a controller such that the steady state error goes to zero, right? So in order to know whether the steady state error is going to zero or not, uh, you have to convert the error into time domain, but the final value theorem allows us to look at just the frequency, not the frequency domain, but in the Laplace domain, and figure out what the steady state error is going to look like. So let's look at an example. We'll, we'll cover an example, and you will see exactly how this is utilized, okay? Any question on final value theorem? The key thing I want to illustrate is you have to know that the signal has a limit, okay, before you apply final value theorem. Uh, it may not be very hard in certain applications to know that the error will go to zero or error will converge to some value or not. Or rather, the signal will converge to some value or not. And in, we will apply this result repeatedly on the error signal uh, that we just studied. Okay. All right, so we have some more time. I'm going to talk about a concrete control system. And we will try and design a controller in this class and the next class in order to show that steady state error, uh, to, in order to compute what the steady state error for a particular choice of controller looks like. So the system is as follows. I have rollers, I have a steel plate, and it goes through two motors that are rotating in opposite direction. Yeah, this is the conveyor belt. And this is the steel plate. <coughs> so these motors are rotating in opposite direction. And you want to And you want to put the steel plate in between these two motors in order to make sure that the plate has uniform thickness across the entire uh, length. Okay, so as soon as, so right now the motors do not have any load on it, but as soon as the steel plate goes in between the two motors, there is a step disturbance to the functioning of these motors, okay? And it remains a step disturbance all the way until the plate comes out. Like the entire plate has to come out in order for that disturbance to go back to zero. Okay? So a control system for this looks something like this. You have a reference signal R of S. This is my controller. K of A.
this is my tachometer k of t k m over r a and the output is omega of s. This example is from section 4.4 .4 in the 12th edition of the book. Okay, so let's look at what is happening. Uh, we want these motors to rotate at a specific speed. Okay, so that's the omega of s. That's the rotating speed of the motor. So we want to send it a reference signal, uh, which is rotate at this particular speed. Now, as soon as the steel plate comes in between these two motors, it adds a disturbance, a negative force uh, on the motor, and the motor starts spinning slowly. So we want to design a controller which takes as input, so this omega of s is, is measured by a tachometer. Tachometer essentially me measures the rotating speed of whatever is the rotating body. Uh, so, so you put a tachometer on these motors, which measures the speed, the speed at which the motor is rotating, and it sends it back to the controller. The controller takes the error between the reference signal and the tachometer reading, multiplies it by a gain Ka, and then that particular thing goes into the motor, uh, and then that results in whatever omega of s, whatever the rotating speed of the motor is. Okay? So we want to reject the disturbance Td of s to make sure that omega of s doesn't really change when a steel plate enters the motor in between these two motors. Okay? So somebody did the modeling part using the essential using the basic physics uh, principles of physics in order to come up with this uh, block diagram for that particular control system. Okay? Now, our goal as a control engineer is to figure out this controller so that we can reject the disturbance uh, with respect to the output. Okay? Now, what's the first step that we need to do? Well, we need to figure out the transfer function between omega and Td, right? That's step one that we need to do. So let's try and do that. So this is, uh, there is more block diagrams in this class than you can imagine. I wish there was a magic wand and we could just 
rotate it and we get the block diagram, like the simplified block diagram, but that doesn't happen. Uh, we have to do it ourselves. Now what I want to ask you guys is, how should I move blocks around so that I can easily compute the input-output relationship between omega of s, td of s, and r of s? Any thoughts? Which block should I move and where in order to easily compute the input-output relationship? Yeah. Could you condense the three of them in that smaller feedback loop into one? Three. Which three? Uh, this one? Yeah. But there is a TD of S here, uh, which is important. I don't want to remove that. Any other thoughts? So the first thing that, uh, I don't know your name, but one of the first thing that your classmate offered is, first uh, option is to reduce this particular block, but I'm hesitant in doing that because we have a TD of S as input in this particular block. So I don't want to touch this block. What are the other options available to us? Yeah. Starting with t the response from TDS. OK. Are we, are we yeah, we are, we are interested in the response with respect to TDS as well as R of S. OK. We want to figure out what the error is going to be, error signal is going to be. Anyone else had some ideas, some thoughts? Yeah. You can move the cam over RA out. KM over RA out. Uh, how would that help us? Okay, that's just a wild guess. Okay, uh, you are you are close, but you are you know you you move the wrong block. <laughs> you have any thoughts? Anyone else has? How about putting the KA in? Would that help? So I'm not touching this, and then I'm moving this plus sign on this side and moving KA within this uh, block. Um, so let's see how that helps us. So I have R of S. I'm moving K of A in this particular loop. So I have R of S plus minus this is KT and minus okay so I have x1 of s entering or let me call this as x1 of s x2 of s x3 of s and x4 of s so I have here x1 of s and this thing should have ka multiplied to it km over ra Okay, so now I am multiplying x3 of s to ka, so I need to divide it by ka here. This is my x3 of s. This is x1 minus x3 over ka.
okay so i have x2 minus x3 entering km over ra block Okay, so what I have done is I have moved this controller block inside and in order to make sure that the signal entering KM over RA is exactly the same as in that block, I need to add a KA term here and I need to add a 1 over KA term here in the feedback loop in order to make sure that the signal entering this particular block is X2 minus X3 and then after that all the signals remain the same and you get omega of s as the output. So we'll take up, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll end this class here and in the next class we are going to draw an equivalent block diagram uh, which will minimize the clutter here and so we'll have to, then we'll be able to better understand what the relationship between omega of s and td of s and r of s is. So see you on Friday. <coughs>